been here before, you know that Bruce is going through a series. The series is Jesus Said What? And when he asked me to speak, I, my curiosity was, what? Which one? I don't know what he's going to talk about. You know, and the original idea came from a book. It was by John Piper, and it's what Jesus demands from the world. Some of Jesus' statements are hit us strangely. I mean, they're just kind of odd. They hit you strangely. Other ones jolt us, and others sound scary, and that's kind of where we're going today. Still others are just flat out hard to understand, and yet, when, when you think about it, I think they actually hit the people in Jesus' time very differently than they hit us. They understood what Jesus was saying. They understood the analogies. We often don't have to explain them. We, we try to explain them. He didn't have to. Most people understood, understood what they meant, and they sent many people away excited because they were excited by what Jesus was saying. I think most of them were just scared and probably not wagging their heads and wondering where they could go because they just couldn't believe it. Today, what I want to do is focus. It's Matthew chapter 10. And if, you want, if you've got a Bible you want to turn to, we'll start at about verse 16 and go through verse 31. Uh, focusing on specific things. But what I want to do is just focus on these words of Jesus today. And I'm not going to read the entire passage. We'll hit each verse individually as we go through. Starting at verse 16, it says, Look, I am sending you out as a sheep among wolves, so be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. But beware, for you will be handed over to the courts and will be flogged with whips in the synagogues. You'll stand trial before governors and kings because you're my followers. When you are arrested, don't worry about how to respond or what to say. Dropping down to verse 21, a brother will betray his brother to death. A father will betray his own child, and children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. All nations will hate you because you are my followers, but everyone who endures to the end will be saved. And since I, the master of the household, skipping down just a little bit, have been called the prince of demons, the members of my household will be called even worse names. Skipping down to verse 26, it says, But don't be afraid of those who threaten you. Verse 28, Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. So don't be afraid you are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. About down in verse 30, 31. The message for today is don't be intimidated. Do not fear. Those are the words that, that we're focusing on today. And think for a moment. Well, if you were hearing these words of Jesus for the very first time, what do you focus upon? Think about what I just read. What do you focus on? Most of us focus on what they fear. It's natural for us to focus on what they fear. Let's go down the list for a second. You'll be sheep among wolves. There's a picture we can understand. Handed over to judges. Flogged. Arrested. Hauled in front of civil leaders because we're Christians. Hated by most people. Most translations put the word in nations. Hated by most nations. Threatened with death, even by family members. Called horrible names. The message translates it, dung face. Now, there's a word we can identify with. We probably heard it in our high school classes. Now, we wouldn't say it exactly the same way, but you've heard the word. It's stuck around for generations, centuries. Threatened with death as Christians. Jesus is a realist. He understands what people are going to be up against. The first, if you look at Matthew 10 as a whole, the very first part of it, beginning at verse 5, we find Jesus sending out his disciples with some very clear instructions. He's sending them out to, to minister, to preach, with some very clear instructions. Beginning at about verse 16, where we started, that's kind of the tail end of those instructions. And we can see how much of this really became a reality for the people that Jesus was talking to in, in the book of Acts, his early followers. What happened to his early followers? They were arrested right off. Book of, book of Acts chapter 4. Arrested. They were imprisoned. They were ordered not to teach about Jesus. One, one situation in Acts. We don't know what to do with these people. We, got to, we know they've been with Jesus. What are we going to do? We're going to order them not to teach. I thought that's going to work, you know. But not to teach about Jesus. They were stoned. Stephen was stoned. Paul was stoned, although he didn't die. Um, there was one who had his head cut off, James. You know, trials in front of the kings and civil leaders. Christianity rubs most of the world the wrong way. And Jesus is saying, be prepared for that. Don't be surprised by that. But much of this is aimed beyond, just to, beyond the disciples, I believe. Jesus has something very specific in mind that's threatened by fear and advanced by courage. And the purpose of Jesus' words here are to give us the courage to speak 
the truth clearly and openly no matter what we face as Christians, as followers of Christ. In verses 24 through 31, and you know, you're lucky I don't have the slides because nobody would be able to read it. In verses 24 through 31, Jesus repeats the command, do not fear. The message puts it like this. I like that. The message says in verse 26, don't be intimidated. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. So don't be intimidated by all this bully talk. I mean, it's putting us up as, as you're up against a bunch of bullies. And, and that's the way, another way of looking at the wolf sheep kind of a picture. The New Living says it this way. But don't be afraid of those who threaten you. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. So don't be afraid. So exactly what does Jesus have in mind that, that is threatened by fear and advanced by courage? If you look at verses 26 and 27, and I'll read them for you, you get, a little, I think, a really clear idea. It says, but don't be afraid of those who threaten you. For the time is coming when everything that is covered will be revealed, and all that is secret will be made known to all. What I tell you now in the darkness, shout abroad when daybreak comes. What I whisper in your ear, shout from the housetops for all to hear. See, the fear that Jesus warns us about is the fear of speaking clearly and openly what we know to be true about Jesus Christ. Jesus is instructing his followers to speak clearly and openly what he's taught us, even if it costs us our lives, to be courageous and speak the truth all of the truth that God has given us, we are to be prepared to speak clearly and openly. What he makes clear to you in this verse, behind the scenes, speak in places where people can hear. What the truth that he quietly whispers into your spirit, make clear to people as he makes that available to you, as he gives you the opportunity, you know, which talks about relationship. What kind of a relationship do you have with Jesus? What kind of a relationship do you have with God? Do you have a relationship with God? Do you spend time with the Lord? Read his word on your knees in prayer or in a chair in prayer. Some, it's hard for me after having four knee surgeries to get on my knees. That's hard. I get on one knee. I can't get on the other knee. So most of my prayer time is sitting. But I mean, what, when do you, what is he whispering in your ear? See, I don't care about the position. I care about the position of your heart and your head before the master. What's he saying to you? He's saying, that's what I want you to share. I like the way John Piper looks at verses 26 through 31. And that's really the crux of what I want to talk about this morning. He describes five reasons to have courage in the cause of truth. I've phrased some of them differently because I like it differently said a little bit different. But in, in verses 26 through 31, five reasons to have courage in the cause of truth. Look at verse 26. The first word in verse 26 is so or therefore, depending on your translation. So or therefore, have no fear of them. Fearlessness flows from what Jesus said just before the sower, the therefore, which is a student should be satisfied to become like his teacher. A servant should be satisfied to become like his master. If the head of the family is called Beelzebul, then the other members of the family will be called worse names. Jesus is saying that mistreatment, name calling, whatever, is not some unexpected, random, meaningless experience. It's an experience that... We all should share with Jesus because that's how they treated Christ. In essence, what he's saying is it's a sign that you indeed belong to me, to Jesus. The first reason that we should be fearless is because those ugly names that you may be called or are called bind us together with Christ. It lumps you together with Jesus. You know, when you share something like that, you know, the, the natural thing is, oh my goodness, you can back up. What, what they're really doing, and that's why in other places in the New Testament says, rejoice when people say nasty things about you. Not because you're making an impression you are, but because it unites us together. These ugly words identify us with Christ. So don't be afraid to speak the truth plainly. People's ugly responses identify you and me with Jesus. Listen to the situation from John chapter 8. I, I love this little story from John chapter 8. It says, the people retorted, you Samaritan devil, they're talking to Jesus. You're talking to the Messiah and you're calling him a Samaritan devil. A Samaritan number one, a devil number two. Didn't we say all, that you, didn't we say all along that you were possessed by a demon? Now they're saying he's possessed by a demon. This is Jesus. No, Jesus said, I have no demon in me. For I honor my father and you dishonor me. And though I have no wish to glorify myself, God is going to glorify me. He is the true judge. I tell you the truth, anyone who obeys my teaching will never die. Now think about that. 
They already thought he was crazy. Now he says, the father's going to honor him, not honor them, because, you know, he, there's, there's a connection. Then he says, but if you listen to what I have to say, you will never die. The people, if they had as much hair as I did, they wouldn't have much left because they'd be pulling it out. It was driving them nuts. The people said, now we know you are possessed by a demon. Even Abraham and the prophets died. But you say, anyone who obeys my teaching will never die? Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus answered, if I want glory for myself, it doesn't count. But it is my Father who will glorify me. You say, he is our God. But you don't even know him. I know him. If I said otherwise, I would be as great a liar as you are. But I do know him, and I obey him. Your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and was glad. The people said, you aren't even 50 years old. How can you say you've seen Abraham? Can't you see him looking out there saying, "There's, yeah, that guy's 60, 70. Nobody here's seen Abraham for crying out loud. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was even born, I am. At that point, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus was hidden from them and left the temple. There's a whole other sermon in that. Jesus was hidden from them and left the temple. What does that mean? We obviously don't have time for that this morning. But this is a wonderful example of exactly what we're talking about this morning. Where Jesus speaking the truth was called horrible names. Think about Jesus being called son of the devil, prince of the devil. It's just awful. And he responded as he told his followers to respond in this passage in Matthew. He knew the truth. He clearly knew who he was. Remember what he just said. I, before Abraham was, I am. He clearly knew who he was, but the people listening denied everything he was saying and insulted him in every way possible. Jesus was not intimidated by the ugly names because he knew that in the end his truth would be exactly, would be vindicated and it would come out exactly as he says it's going to come out. He'd be proven to be exactly who he said he was and the truth of eternal life would be discovered by all, no matter whether they go to the heaven or hell. They would understand that what he said was true. Didn't matter which direction they were going. Jesus said he's sending us out like sheep in the midst of wolves. Now there's a picture we can kind of understand. We got so used to it, it kind of floats right over our head. But what happens when you put a sheep in the midst of wolves? It becomes lunch. I mean, it's just what happens. That's to be expected. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, you pick. And if it's in between, it's a snack. That's what happens when you put a wolf in between. So, and what Jesus is saying, that's what you are, and that's the way it's going to feel, but don't be intimidated. Do not fear. Now, I get that picture, and if I'm the sheep and there's wolves all around me, it's hard for me to say, I'm not going to be intimidated, and no, I'm not going to be afraid. But he says, don't be surprised by the response of wolves toward sheep. Expect it. Have courage in the cause of the truth. Respond carefully and as cunningly as a snake and avoiding trouble. You know, I, I, I fish. I love to fly fish. I fly fish in rattlesnake country. And people say, why do you do that? Because most of the time the rattlesnakes leave. Occasionally, if they don't hear you coming, they won't leave and you can get bitten. So you make lots of noise, so they leave. And, and so you will be sitting in the river for a couple of hours fishing and the rattlesnakes will come out of where they were hiding. And then all of a sudden, in the afternoon, they start to rattle. And then you can say, oh, here they are again. So when you get out of the water, you make lots of noise. So the snakes, they hide. They, be they hide beautifully. So you want to hide like as cunningly and carefully as a snake while being as harmless as a dove in the process. I, that's an interesting. I mean, you're, you're like a sheep among wolves and you're supposed to be cunning as a snake but act like a dove. I mean, again, it's twist, it twists you around. But I like the way Peter says it with, in 1 Peter 3.15. He says, when you, when you share the gospel, you share it with gentleness and respect doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter how they say it. You do it with gentleness and respect. That's how Jesus did. It doesn't matter what they say. And if they call you ugly names, and some will, that's okay because that's what they did to Jesus. And that links you together with Jesus. The next reason to have courage, I think, is if the cause of truth is found in verses 26 and 27. And let me read them for you. But don't be afraid of those who threaten you. For a time is coming... When everything that is covered will be revealed, and all that is secret will be made known to all. What I tell you now in the darkness, shout abroad when daybreak comes. What I whisper in your ear, shout from the housetops for all to hear. Look at the word for in the middle of that verse, those verses. For, and then here comes the second reason. 
For a time is coming when everything that is covered will be revealed and all that is in secret will be made known to all. How exactly does that give us courage in the cause of truth? Because Jesus says a time is coming when all the secrets of individuals' lives, the sins that people hide, that have hidden for years, maybe all their lives, will be revealed. And according to Jesus, there's a time coming when all truth will be revealed. All truth. It isn't so much about secrets, it's about who Jesus is, who God is, how this whole thing is put together. All those secrets will be revealed and they will be made known. And bottom line is, Jesus says, trust me, this judgment time is coming, so be fearless to speak what I have taught you. People may laugh at you now, they may scoff at the way you think, they may say, you believe, what you believe can't be proven. But Jesus says, have faith. Have faith. Don't be silent. The day is coming when everything that is covered will be revealed and all that is in secret will be made known to all. The message says it like this, and pardon me for a second here. The message says it like this. Eventually, everything is going to be out in the open, and everyone will know how things really are. So don't hesitate to go public now. I love that. Why hide it? Go public with it. Do they, if they don't receive it, that's okay. You know it's going to be true. Fearlessness flows from knowing that the truth we are speaking will ultimately prove to be true, regardless of what people think. I believe this goes way beyond people's hidden secrets. Think about it. When the father and son show up on the scene, what changes? Everything changes. Come on now. Well, God doesn't exist. Well, he's right there. Uh Uh-oh. Well, I don't believe in Jesus. Jesus wasn't really a historian. Oh, boy. Everything changes. It's all different. What the way they think the world is now, and they're going to find out that the world, it's totally different. And here's proof. Everything changes. Everything changes. Your message will be vindicated as the truth if you have the courage to let God speak his message through you. And you may not have to wait for the distant future. God has ways to get people's attention here and now. See, if you only listen to this, you say, well, why share it? They're all going to hate me. Not all of them. Many of them are. Many of them are going to respond that way, but many are going to say, tell me more. Tell me more about Jesus. Tell me more about your experience with Christ. Tell me more about how Jesus helped you get through that situation. Tell me more, and all of a sudden you will find that you not only have a friend, you have a brother or a sister in Christ, and that changes the dynamics. It doesn't matter how many people said something to you anymore. It's all different now. And if God doesn't get those people's attention... It doesn't matter because Jesus promised that it's all going to be explained in the future. And at that point in time, they're going to feel bad that they didn't listen. So have no fear. If they listen, fantastic. If they don't, okay. But do it with gentleness and respect. I find the third reason to be fearless in verse 28. And this is the one that most people pick up on right away. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, okay, we, we've done, dealt with that one. Bruce dealt with that one a little bit before. Fearlessness flows from knowing the worst that man can do to you is dispatch you to paradise. That's the worst. So they can call you terrible names just like they did Jesus and identify you with Christ. You can have the faith to know that the truth you are speaking will ultimately prove to be true no matter what they think now. And the worst that anyone can do is take your life and send you into the presence of Christ, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Don't be intimidated. You can only be killed. Now most people, oh my goodness. See, death is a scary thing. I deal with it a lot next door. But let me ask you this. Do you believe in heaven? Do you really believe in heaven? I'm not saying can you spit the words out. Do you really believe in heaven? Do you believe in the scriptures we read at nearly every memorial service? Or do you like them reserved for only memorial services? Yes, death sounds scary, but it's the, it's the ultimate enemy. Few people embrace it easily. Um, Victor, the chaplain next door, said, well, at the time he's been here, he's done, I don't know how many hundred funerals. And I've been there 10 years longer than he has. So we've done lots of funerals. We know what it is to watch people die. Most of the people are older. 
But Jesus has conquered death and has given us a future, a future eternity that we know is coming. Do you remember the encounter at the grave of Lazarus? This is a passage you read at almost every funeral. This is what it says. Lord, if you had been here, this is Martha. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? See, I, I think, I believe that Jesus looked deeply and lovingly into Martha's eyes when he said, do you believe this, Martha? Do you really believe this, Martha? See, fearlessness flows from how you truly answer that question in your own heart. Do you believe it? Bruce preached a whole sermon on this thought, and here it is again. Think about it. Do you really believe that the worst anyone can do to you for sharing your faith and speaking God's truth is to take your life and dispatch your soul into the hands of God and Jesus Christ? Do you really believe that? Because it's not about something I know. It's about something that I believe enough to step out in faith. That's the essence of believing and being fearless for Christ. Believing it. Making it part of you. So that it doesn't scare you anymore. Do I, do I want to die? No. But if God takes that, if that's where I need to go for Jesus' sake, am I prepared to go? Knowing that I will be dispatched into paradise. I ran into a Christian. You know, this is not long ago. A Christian in a nursing facility. Who, who came to, I thought everything was under control. He was passing away. And I, I sat at his bed one morning and, and I said, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, but I just, I just don't want to die. And I said, well, why? He says, well, what if all my life I believed that heaven was there and it's not? And I said, wow. I said, well, what do you believe about Jesus? Well, I believe in Jesus. I believe he's the son of God. I said, so that makes God, who did Jesus? That makes God Jesus' father. So Jesus talked and we got out the, I read this passage from, from John. I read several other ones. I read from First Peter. I read from several of Paul's passages that we frequently read. I said, so are you sure? He says, I'm sure. I'm just not sure enough to die. <laughs> so you're not sure. The bottom line is you need to be sure. You need to believe it. The fourth reason to be fearless is found in verse 30. If you look at verse 30, it says, and the very, this is one I missed. And the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. So don't be afraid. I'm losing my hair. It's going fast. But, you know, I, I look, I just, so think, I, I think many of us would miss this. After all, some of us have a much easier count than others, you know. It doesn't take long to count mine. It'll take longer to count some of yours. Especially you young people. You used to have hair like that. Why is it important that God knows how many hair we have on our head? Why is it important? Is it, does it really matter? See, I used to take this verse and laugh when they read it. So, oh, come on, that really doesn't matter. Why? But it does matter. What difference does it make in terms of our being fearless? Because it demonstrates just how close and intimate God is in our lives. See, I never thought of it that way. Just how close and intimate God is in our lives. God gives intimate attention to all that you do. Often we don't believe that. Any suffering that we experience for speaking the truth is not because God doesn't care or is disinterested in our situation. He cares deeply. Jesus says he's close enough to separate one hair from another. I doubt how many people have been that close to another human being. And give each one a number. Don't distract me. I'm not sure, I'm sure I could keep counting that far. He is interested. He cares that much. Fearlessness flows from knowing that God cares intimately for you. He is close. He is interested. He cares deeply. And he knows your heart as intimately as he knows your head. That's the point here. He knows your heart just as much as he knows any, any, other, any part of the rest of you. And he cares deeply for you. So fear not because God is close to you and cares about you up close and personal. The fifth reason I think we should be fearless is found in verses 29 and 31. And let me read them. I'll put them together for you. What is the price of two sparrows? And I got to confess, I'm a little guilty because most of my young life I had a pellet gun. And I was hunting sparrows. 
And I look at this now and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, it's a lot of prayers I need to ask for forgiveness. What, what is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows and a stupid teenager with a pelican. <laughs> Fearlessness is rooted in knowing that God will not let anything happen to you apart from his gracious will. Nothing can happen to you that he hasn't approved of, that he hasn't allowed. Knowing that no harm can come to you except what God allows. He's close from the previous reasons, so close that he knows and feels everything that you do. You feel it, he feels it. You sense it, he senses it. He's right there with you. Jesus' point here is that God governs the world all the way down to the smallest detail. Birds falling to the ground. I, I had a wonderful class in, in theology when I was uh, going to Christian college and but the, but the professor would consistently tell us, well, there are some things that God doesn't worry about. And, and you know, I, I, I can't, yes, there are. God worries about all that stuff. God, God knows about all that stuff. He permits all that stuff. We may get confused by the things that happen around us. We may have difficulty understanding, but God is involved. It doesn't work out sometimes the way you want, but no harm can come to you that God has not permitted or allowed. That's what this is talking about. We can often say these words, these kind of words. They come out of our mouths, we can read them, and we can say, yeah, 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 I believe that. But boy, do we struggle with truly believing them. We really do. So many things happen that we cannot fully understand. You know, it's, uh, we wanted something different. It should have worked out differently. If I presented the, it should have come out this way. It should have had this answer. We wanted it to be different, but God says, trust me, I'm right here by your side. I'm right there with you. Fearlessness flows from knowing that no harm can come to you except what God allows. Now if you're, if you're wondering, trying to keep up with that, all of these are listed on the back side of your little outline in one of these. They're listed in, right in the middle there, you'll see this bullet list. I had them on a slide, but they're right there in the bullet list. It's, they're there. The question is, no harm can come to you except what God allows. Do you trust him enough to believe that? Do you really trust him enough to believe that? You are safe in the hands of God as you speak the truth. This confidence has given, this has given great courage to the followers of Jesus throughout history. I, when I, my struggle in writing a sermon like this and thinking about it is, well, you can tell a story about this martyr and that martyr and this martyr and that martyr, and I could be here for hours talking about martyrs. But do you really trust him? I mean, one of the things that I loved, I ran across this quote by Henry Martin. If God has work for me to do, I cannot die. If God has work for me to do, I cannot die. Henry Martin, we are immortal until the work God has for us is done. I like that. And I think it's true. Believing that truth will make a profound difference in your ability to speak for Jesus. You know, one of the things that I noticed, and I didn't have a slide, but I listed all these things on the back here in, in, the, in the Life app, and it says knowing the truth that we're speaking will ultimately be proved to be true, and knowing the worst, and knowing that God, and knowing that no harm can come to you. Sometimes when I was preaching the first sermon, I said, you know, I should have changed all of that. It shouldn't be knowing, it should be believing. It's, it's not about knowledge. We all have the knowledge. I would bet you if I tapped you on the shoulder and started a verse, many of you could repeat it. We have the knowledge, but do we believe that that's true? Because it takes that kind of belief for us to be able to speak out clearly and plainly what we believe so we don't cower in fear when somebody intimidates us. That's, it takes belief. It takes belief to say, to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. That's, that's a lifestyle. It's a belief. Let me close by reading a few verses immediately following this passage this morning. And, and there, I read them for this purpose. Sometimes we read a passage like this in these words of Jesus, do not be intimidated, do not fear, and, and we, we can just blow it out our ears. And Next kind of a thing. We don't think that Jesus takes it all that seriously. If you read the rest of this, you realize how seriously he takes it. Starting at verse 32, it says, Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will deny before my Father in heaven. Don't imagine that I come to bring peace to the earth. You know, when it says peace on earth, goodwill toward men, it's really peace on earth to men on whom his favor rests. It's not, it's not going to be for everybody. 
I don't imagine that I came to bring peace on this earth. I came to bring, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. You know, see, it's a question of what do you believe? And, and that's the sharp thing that separates people. Especially if you're, if you're in a different country, like a Muslim country, or pick a, pick a, all of a sudden somebody becomes a Christian. It's a, just a horrible snap between people that comes down. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. That's the truth. You give up your life for me, you'll find it. Lots of people are looking for life. And they're looking for something that they can do or something they can have. or something. That's not going to give you life. You find life in serving Christ. You really do. Yes, to the average person in the world that doesn't know Jesus, that's meaningless. It's meaningless. And we'll be covering several of the statements I read in future lessons, so we're not going to talk about them. But speaking clearly and openly of your faith in Christ and the truth he reveals to you is serious business for Jesus. Jesus said he came to bring a sword, not a sword of steel, but a sword of truth that gives eternal life to all who believe and separates believers from non-believers if you really take it seriously. And I'm here to say this morning, love his truth. Love his truth. Trust his truth. The truth that he puts in his scriptures, learn to know it. The truth that he whispers in your ear that you begin to understand. Make sure you make that a part of your life so that you can share it. So love his truth, trust his truth, and trust him. That's really the answer to this whole thing. Do not fear. You love his truth, trust his truth, trust him. Fear fades away. And what he reveals to you in the quietness of your own prayer and study, speak clearly and share with your friends. As, as he gives you opportunity. And he will give you opportunity. He will. I guarantee he will. And be brave and courageous. Do not be intimidated and do not fear because you really have nothing to fear. But it's very easy to make a list of the things I do. And that's why it's important to sometimes go back to a passage like this and read it and remind yourself and ask yourself, am I really serious about this? <laughs> Thank you.